Hi everyone, my name is Kelly Arrowsmith and Mark Human and I are here to tell you a little bit about multidimensional warriors. We get lots of questions and hopefully we'll be able to answer most of them today. Mark, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Mark. I head up training and development for MDW. I'm also an ACT instructor. I have a degree in sports sciences and military mastering as a biokinetician and I've trained in various martial arts in various countries around the world since the age of 10. Um, back to you, Carol. You also got quite an extensive background. In your... Yeah, I've got, I've got a, a, a varied background. I started martial arts when I was eleven, um, <clears throat> and I've done quite a few styles. I've I've been very lucky to train with some of the top people in the world in different styles, uh, including Shotokan, uh, Jiu Jitsu, traditional Jiu Jitsu, and BJJ and Kempo, and I used to compete professionally. I head up the training and development for ACT and you and I complement one another very, very nicely uh, because we have very different ways of thinking about things and so we're able to problem solve uh, specific violent confrontational uh, items from, from two very different focuses. MDW is not about Mark and I, it's really about our instructors and trainers. It's a massive collective knowledge from around the globe, including people who are masters in their own right. People like Andy Elliott from Kali 3D. Aki Marty Kanan yeah, from Kali Sikaran. Mike Bowers from Badugo Martial Arts. Francois Ladezik from Chakra Maga in France. Clint Oerstazen from Kova Jitsu and he boxing. And um, people that have done select background, like Erin Chappell, our trainer in training in um, Florida at the moment. Okay. So, are you ready for some questions? Let's go for it. Okay. So, what is MDW? Is it a style? That is a question we often get asked, and it's, it's kind of a difficult one to answer in a way, because we have such an amalgamation of knowledge from the sports sciences background, from all the training that we've done, even in with you, working with Microsoft and the training over there, we've learned how to transfer skills. So we've really developed a framework and a problem solving methodology there from skills and framework to complement each other. Mm. So if you think about it, we'll go out there and we'll see a chaotic problem and then we actually go see how to navigate it um, to design the solutions that suit the problem. If you think of the martial arts that we did through the years, often we'd have a very, for example, in the Kempo, we had a, we'd have a, a technique called returning the gift, a very effective skill in the right context. But if you end up somewhere like the Cape Flats, where the, the attacks just don't come like that, it doesn't mean the, that technique wouldn't work under the right context. But when someone denies you your skill set by doing something different, you need a different solution. So we've looked at all the skills we've had through the years and our problem solving the methodology we look at it and we say right what skills would help us solve this problem what's very important from then once we've used our, the the problem solving um, scenarios that we run through we would actually go and put those to a test what okay. we think are probable what are probable solutions and often they'll fail and other times we come up with surprises and we say, gee, we didn't realize that would work. We thought that would work. It doesn't work. So it's not about just imagining the solution. We go and replicate what we see on, on the street as the problem. And we do that as close to as real as possible, obviously, without actually um, stabbing, one, stabbing one each other <laughs> and having serious injury. <clears throat> and we put it to the test and we come back to the table with a solution to a specific problem. These then get put back out into the field. And again, we get feedback from there. And um, this is kind of how we can complement other martial art styles. So it's really about testing different <clears throat> tactics, if you will, within different pressures. Because I think pressures really make the difference in what skill you're going to use. Yeah, it's, it's a combination of the scenario and the pressure. And if we, if we want to discuss the terminology pressure, um, a pressure is the person's relationship, how they're moving towards you or away from you in relation to you in a fight. And something that we see, an example, like we said on the Cape Flats, when that person attacks, he will not attack with his whole body behind it. He will 
walk back with his body and use the weapon to throw that forward and we call that a negative body pressure with a very positive weapon pressure mm. and if you reached in there with a with a technique that would be which would normally solve a grab and stab problem um he's denied you your skill set and essentially you get cut to pieces by a fake and pick game so what i find <clears throat> really ex exciting about what we do uh mark is that we we constantly learning new things so it's never static and within a couple of months of teaching a seminar somewhere it's it's out there it's spreading they're using the terminology and the most fantastic thing for for me really is saving people's lives i mean that's that's why i do this otherwise i'd go back to it because it pays better <laughs> that's right <laughs> So <clears throat> another question we get is do you teach only knife? Well, I think we've largely got branded as um, as the knife guys. But because we have such an extensive empty hand background um and other weapons as well. We've other come, other weapons like what? Uh, we've come from the traditional kabujitsu background <clears throat> we've worked with Filipino stick the stick work through the years. Um firearms are a great part of what we do. But if you move back to, are we only a knife system, we really use them all. But our empty hand skills are a great complement to our edge weapon work. And this is why we integrate so easily with other martial artists. Okay, so what kind of people would do MDW? Well, broad range. And I think one of the first things we have already spoken about is our security and law enforcement type of people. Those are people that would be, through their job, almost faced faced with this uh, with um life threatening scenarios so it's very different i mean the way a civilian would have to act in a scenario and the way a security guard or law enforcement a civilian is mandate is to get away whereas law enforcement or security have to engage yeah it's, it's tricky and you can <clears throat> think of things like domestic violence uh, disturbance like that is it's a very tricky situation for a law enforcement officer edge weapon threats are a great thing uh, one of the things that they really have to deal with is they have to look at things like weapon retention against edge weapon attacks mm. and um this is where we fit in very nicely with the law enforcement guys okay but then then how how about civilians why would civilians want to do knife fighting well in a place like south africa but i think around the world there's obvious concern we can see what's happening um internationally we see the odd odd crazy guy run around with a machete um over here our hikers our runners are, are subject to muggings sometimes they are stabbed in those environments so it's but even walking on the beach walking on the beach it's it's a necessity for them to learn to protect themselves not always out of choice and um so why would a runner, for example, do something like MDW? Well, just like we, we said now, we, we have quite a few runners. As a matter of fact, the MDW class in Musenberg has a few few running and outdoor adventure people training with us. Um, and they will quite frankly say they've fallen in love with the training, but they started there because of a threat while they were trail running or rock climbing out in the field or something like that. And they get mugged and some of them have actually got very close to being stabbed. So I've heard about um, <clears throat> a new program that's coming. Yes, um, because of where we are around the world with the runners, the different type of people, specifically civilians, um, there's two different aspects. In a country like South Africa, um, a person can make a choice still to carry an edge weapon to defend themselves or not. And there we have an intro to edge weapons course that says you're going to carry a knife how do you keep it? How do you use this responsibly? How do you not get into trouble with law? How do you avoid confrontation as much as possible? And if you have to use it, how do you do that without being a further risk to yourself? So tell me about the knife proof thing that I'm hearing about. Well, knife proof, we mentioned a little earlier, is very exciting. Um, in a lot of places, it's not always possible to have a knife with you and it's not always mandated to have a knife with you. And again, we, we try to be as socially responsible as possible when it gets to edge weapon work. Um, it needs to be a positive experience for everyone. We try to build it as a, a, good, a good art, a good self-defense skill. Um, but if it's not possible, you're going to be facing an edge weapon empty hand. It's a massive challenge. And through the years, we've identified core things that we've put into three programs for civilians and three programs for law enforcement focused on them 
and we're calling them knife proof one two and three and are they different yes they are and the civilian the the night one knife program is very much about recognizing threats okay i think we need to do another whole video about that yeah we can Uh, otherwise this is going to be very long but in any case the knife proof programs are going to be very beneficial for people that choose not to carry edge weapons Mm -hmm. or are in areas around the world where it's mandated or legalized illegal to carry an edge weapon but you don't want to be helpless out there you at least want to go home at the end of the day so why would a martial artist do mdw he's already doing self-defense well martial martial arts um, provide excellent empty hand skills and some of them have good edge weapon and and um stick skills involved but because um of the way we look at our, our thoughts on edge weapons on weapons and countering scenarios out on the street a lot of them are using these to complement their existing skills so to, we've got quite fo- a few quite a few people that are using mdw to complement to bring in a, a different aspect of edged weapon skills and and stuff like for example plug and press which is unique to mdw where we teach people what to do in case they've been stabbed or shot or a loved one for example has been stabbed or shot so there's a lot of complementary stuff that yes. martial artists can do and i think one thing we do for martial artists um, we'll often have very very skilled martial artists actually very beneficial with their blade work with all that and we create context um, where where their skills fit together so we are often hosted by guys that are again like like some of our trainers masters in their own right an example of that would be um mike blackray from cmoc he's a very experienced edge weapon and filipino martial arts person um linked into wing chung um, very very experienced and um we we have a great synergy with him because we can actually share ideas and link in with each other okay so we are hosted there it's a privilege to be hosted at places like that around the world so what does the year ahead look like and how do I get started in MD, MDW? Well, that's a good question and we like to start you on a good journey. <laughs> so um, I think one of the first ways people can get, get training with us is to start joining our local training groups. Okay. And our local training groups are when we have trainers or trainers in training or instructors where there's a regular class running on a weekly basis or as a private, very much like a martial arts class, but as you heard, the focus is slightly different on, on the combative side of it. So if I if I uh, am a karate school, can I host a web, uh, seminar? Yes, um, like we, we just mentioned, the various martial arts schools around the world host us to come. So what would I do? Um, you would have to contact us through and, our web page. Okay. And we would start talking and see how we complement. Um, we're doing a, a firearms workshop in Mossel Bay down the road in Eastern Cape very soon and that is hosted by a combination Krav Maga, combination um, MMA school that want to add edge weapon skills and firearm skills to their, to their okay. skill set. So it's very much a, a complementary. Um, yeah. um, the other way people can get to train with our trainers is by workshop, local workshops that are presented regionally mm-hmm. and um, they will be focused workshops that will include edge weapon skills, tactical pattern, empty hand skills, and very excited, like we said, in 2019, having our local trainers been instrumental in introducing our knife, our knife proof programs. And those those can be booked through the, through the trainer or through MDW. The other way that people get to train with us is our international seminars. These are very exciting. I love them. I love meeting different people and eating the different food and getting to know the different cultures. So tell us a little bit about the international. What have we got planned? Well, uh, our first one coming up this year would be the US in um, February. We're probably going to make it out to the US um, twice this year. But next year. And uh, next year already. It's <laughs> 2019. A few days away. <clears throat> um, but we normally make it out to the US once to twice a year. And then we'll combine our local trainers hosting us for workshops as well as other schools hosting us for workshops um, besides the US we'll make it to Europe once or twice a year we'll be posting these up in January uh, the, the tentative dates for the rest of the year um, South Africa 
we have one to two international camps besides all the local workshops we do and um, then finally thailand our zoo camp it's always a great highlight for us it's mostly mdw members open to guests on invite and um, it's an exciting camp we train solid four or five hours a day when we're, we're in thailand we relax in the afternoon and um, so why is it called the zoo camp the zoo camp it, it's an interesting thing and it was really started by the Australians when they, they started with us and um, what happened is at the end of the camp we, we gave people an animal name that re resembled the way they behaved and fought during the camp and it's become quite a prestigious thing. It's a lot of fun and um, just a great privilege to earn your, your animal name at the What's zoo your camp. animal name? No, my name's Tiger. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the badger. And I we, don't know why. And we got a whole batch. Andy, Andy in the states, his dog, and in the Australia, Australia's dog, and um, and we've got bears and, and all kinds of animals and snakes and, <laughs> and lion cubs, all the rest of them. Well, it looks like we've covered most of our regular questions that people ask us. Uh, if there is there anything else you wanted to cover before we close? No, I think that's pretty much a wrap. Um, we'll answer the other questions. We'll do some more short videos. Um, one of the things that people will often be asking is how, how they would become a trainer. Um, we're quite, quite picky there, but um, we have a very constructive program along those lines and we'll um, address that in another video. Yeah, so if you want to become a trainer, please contact us. If you want to host a video, uh, host a seminar, please contact us. Um, it's been uh, our first video you know people keep asking us oh you got to do videos and we just really haven't gotten around to it but thanks a lot for joining us today and uh, we'll see you soon that's all from Kelly and Mark <laughs>